Um, it's a real pleasure um, to be here. Um, it's good to see a lot of uh, economists here on a Saturday. I think that really shows commitment. <laughs> but um, I'm going to speak to you um, about this new book that I've written. It's on the great economists, but it's on three aspects of the great economists. One is their lives. The second thing is their ideas. And then the third and probably the most important thing is how can we learn from the lessons of history to help us um, with analyzing and solving our current economic problems. So the idea for the book came from the, really came from a saying um, attributed to Mark Twain, which is um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So I'm going to go through um, some of the, the big, um, the great economists in history and cover about 250 years of um, economic history with you in about uh, 15 minutes or so. <laughs> um, and then um, we're going to talk about the applicability of their ideas to um, our current issues. And then there'll be a chance to have um, Q&A for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then um, there'll be a chance uh, to chat during lunch as well while I'll be doing a book signing after my talk. So that's the plan. Um, and let me get cracking. So the very first thing is, I think, um, I normally start with um, the, this slide because economic ideas have actually changed our world considerably. So I think we as economists, sometimes you might look at your economics problem sets and your texts and it looks a little narrow, a little technical, but actually, uh, the great economists were the ones who engaged with the big issues of the day and their ideas help change the societies in which they live. So economics is one of those subjects which can really transform um, the economy, our lives, if you think about um, big societal changes like I'm going to go through with you now. Economics actually played a key part um, in the big moves of the last 250 years. So there's a lot of examples of this, but I'm just going to give you three of them. So the very first thing is um, the end of protectionism in the middle part of the 19th century brought in a period of globalization that accompanied uh, the industrial revolution, which was sweeping across the advanced economies and gave us the prosperity that we enjoy today. So you'll recall the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. Nobody recalls this except for historians. <laughs> but in 1846, the Corn Laws um, were a protectionist piece of agricultural legislation. Core refers to all grains. So landowners had gotten these massive tariffs to protect um, agricultural output, so therefore their own profits. And they were very much um, the uh, reflection of a long period of mercantilism. Mercantilism is this idea that countries should aim for trade surpluses. If that sounds a little bit familiar to today, um, I will come back to that. Um, so mercantilists believe that a country should have a trade surplus. They'll be protectionist about achieving it. And even better, if they can find some gold and silver and bring it back to their shores, you know, that would be the ultimate way of getting your surplus. Uh, but that idea was defeated through the efforts of great economists like David Ricardo, who is the author of um, The Theory of Comparative Advantage, who argued that it wasn't a trade surplus that mattered. In fact, it was comparative advantage, this idea that countries should specialize and trade, which raises productive efficiency as well as what societies can consume, that ought to be the focus. So the focus should be how efficient you are within your own country and trade becomes a byproduct of that. So after Ricardo's death, um, his uh, efforts and the efforts of other classical economists were realized and the Corn Laws were repealed and the very first free trade agreement ever signed was signed in 1870 uh, by Richard Cobden. It was the Cobden Chevalier Act, and that was a trade agreement between Britain and France. And that was, um, and it was really believed that commercial relations was better than war. <laughs> and, um, and it really shaped, it changed the way that we think about globalization and how countries interact. So that massive change um, happened in the 19th century. And of course, I referred to this a moment ago, we're revisiting that debate again today. So history um, doesn't repeat, but the battle of ideas um, 
is ongoing. And then the other um, big ideas um, that I want to mention that changed the world is the emergence of welfare state capitalism over socialism after World War II. So the, uh, the capitalism of the classical economists stemming from the Industrial Revolution, that resulted in a massive um, economic crisis at the end of the 19th century. The Panic of 1873, um, which was when the US financial system went into a meltdown and then affected um, advanced economies, sounds awfully familiar, that led to the first Great Depression of the 19th century known as the Long Depression. That was when unemployment first appeared in the dictionary, and that was when people turned against capitalism and um, embraced socialism and even communism. Um, and so by the early part of the 20th century, 60% of the world its population lived in either communist or socialist regimes. And you had a real battle of ideas between those systems and um, capitalism. So it led to capitalism reforming itself and it became welfare state capitalism. So this is the creation of the welfare state. So the NHS in this country, social security in America, the continent developed social security systems as well. So capitalism, accepted a social safety net, and this battle continued really probably until the end of the Cold War at the end of the 1980s, when it looked like capitalism and democracy had won the day over uh, communism, socialism, and non-democracies. Um, and at the end of the 1980s, the fall of communism, the dismantling of the Soviet Union um, seemed to mark um, the, and it, this, if you look at the dates here, it took nearly, it took 80 years, 90 years, if not a century, to really get to a consensus around what economic system we ought to be living in. Um, but then, of course, today, that's also now being re-examined in the 21st century, which is, is the capitalist system that we currently have um, fit for purpose, or we should be looking for alternatives? So these battles are always ongoing, and frankly, they should be. We should always be examining the society in which we live. Um, I normally um, would say the, um, the fall of the Berlin Wall was one of the you know, massive changes for people who remember it. And then I realized a lot of you were not born then, so I'm just going to move on. <laughs> you get the picture. Um, so the ideas, I'm sorry, the ideas um, that I'm talking about yeah, it's not over yet. <laughs> I only got to the ideas. Okay. The ideas come from people, and these are the people um, that I'm talking about. So, as I say in the book, every chapter is titled something like, Do Trade Deficits Matter? And then I look at the main economic model, um, and then who wrote it, and then all the data around what's happening today, and what, how they would analyze it. So that's the structure. So. In terms of the great economists that I write about, I write about uh, 12 of them, and they are people who work on macroeconomic growth development, the construction of economic systems. So I don't include microeconomists, I don't include finance people. Obviously, this is um, um, there's only so much space you have uh, to write about it, but I think these pick up the big models, touching on the questions that affect us today. So just to give you a rough sense of um, the great economists uh, who shaped these um, big macro trends. Going back 250 years, I've placed them roughly on a spectrum between state and market. Um, it's not perfect, obviously. This is just a rough topography. Um, so Adam Smith is the father of economics. I've already talked about David Ricardo, who started the classical economic tradition um, following Adam Smith. And they're closer to the market end. But the reason they're sort of in the middle is that the classical economist, Adam Smith, actually not only um, was he not a laissez-faire economist, he never even used the word capitalism. He believed in a role for the state, um, but a role for, of the state in providing the right setup for the economy so that it could act um, efficiently in line with his theory of the invisible hand. So he believed in non-distortionary governmental policies, but he was always deeply suspicious um, of the role of government, um, which is why he's uh, sort of farther in the market side. Um, there's a quote um, in The Wealth of Nations, um, which says, there is no act which one government learns faster than that 
um, uh, there's no act which one government learns um, faster from other governments, which is the act of taking money from the pockets of the people. <laughs> so, um, so in that kind of vein, there's a role for the state, but they are much more market driven. And then I mentioned uh, Karl Marx. So Karl Marx saw the exact same Industrial Revolution as Adam Smith and David Ricardo. And he just thought they did not take capitalism or this market system that was evolving to its natural logical conclusion. He said, so you've got a capitalist system where workers are exploited by capitalists. That's actually when capitalism was first used. There was an antonym to Marxism. Um, it was actually first used by the author of Vanity Fair in a novel to denote a capital owner. So he said, capitalists exploit workers. Workers um, are paid a wage by capitalists who retain all the profits. Surely the next, the next logical stage is rebellion and revolution. <laughs> and then there's going to be a push for an egalitarian system. And I've got that egalitarian system, which is communism. So he saw exactly the same thing, but he believed that it led to a very different conclusion. So this is another example of the battle of ideas. Um, he did not accept the mainstream economic thinking and thought they were uh, not seeing the full picture. And then I've got here um, the neoclassical economists. So they're neoclassical economists because people like Alfred Marshall um, was one of the ones, he was a late Victorian, so he lived through the long depression. He saw what was happening with unemployment. He saw that the capitalism wasn't working. And they accepted the creation of a welfare state so long as it didn't disincentivize work. So in other words, this is your very uh, st standard economic um, you know, assessment, which is we can do these policies if it doesn't hurt growth. And so he saw the evidence around what was happening with some redistributive policies, and they started to introduce this welfare element. So this is a neoclassical movement. Uh, you know your um, supply and demand diagrams that you, uh, you know, 50% chance of moving the curve up, you know, the right way, <laughs> each curve. So that was Adam Smith. But if you really hate equations, it's actually Irving Fisher, who um, you, should, um, <laughs> you should know about. And so I'll come to him. But he is the father of America's neoclassical economic tradition. He introduced mathematics into economics, and he shifted the headquarters of economics from here to America. Um, and then uh, there was John Maynard Keynes, who I've positioned sort of between the state and market, because John Maynard Keynes made the first positive argument for a role for state intervention, not only in economic downturn, during economic downturns, but actually, um, if you read uh, his works, the general theory argues that economies are generally speaking not at full employment. Um, so therefore, there was always a role for the state, especially in terms of investment. So Keynes is in the middle there. Uh, his disciple, uh, Joan Robinson, I've placed sort of slightly to the left. So Joan Robinson is the person who came up with the theory of monopsony. So this is when employers have market power and can set a wage which is below the value of marginal product for a worker. Monopsony was discussed at Jackson Hole this year, last year, um, as an explanation for why wages are so low, which is one of the chapters. So Robinson took the Keynesian ideas of sticky wages, sticky prices, and perfect competition and extended it to explaining labor markets. But the reason why she's slightly to the left there is that even though she was one of the five people entrusted by Keynes at Cambridge, within the Cambridge, his inner circle, there were five entrusted to review the general theory, um, Oh, and by the way, uh, Joan Robinson was married to one of the other members of the inner circle, and she was having an affair with yet another member. So I like to think she had a controlling three out of five vote on the general theory. <laughs> um, but she later on in her career disavowed Keynesianism, and she embraced communism. So she turned up at lectures like this wearing a peasant, Vietnamese peasant outfit. <laughs> so I've moved her uh, more towards Marx. Um, then, um, then there are the free market economists. Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, who's actually a libertarian, um, and Joseph Schumpeter. So they are much more, again, you see the Keynesian tradition, and they are at the other extreme. So they've essentially said, that's wrong. 
<laughs> um, markets need to operate even more freely because you're just introducing uh, distortions through government intervention. And their arguments were so, for some of them, people like Hayek, um, were so far to the market end um, that um, Hayek equated capitalism with freedom. So Hayek's argument was in a democracy, and Milton Friedman, one of his books, his best -selling, one of his best-selling books is called Free to Choose. It's this idea that in a, in a democracy where everyone has freedom, individual choice, you decide where you work, who you vote for, what you produce, what you buy, that system is only compatible with a capitalist system. Because under a socialist system or a communist system, you've relinquished your rights to the state for the state to decide where you work, what you produce, and in some cases, um, your personal choices as well as to where you live. And so their argument very much pushed back against this idea that socialism or communism um, was somehow compatible with a democracy when it infringed on the very freedoms that define you um, as a free individual um, in a democracy. So they were very much on this side of the spectrum, and Friedrich Hayek was the um, ideological um, influence behind the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions of the 1980s that brought about much more free market um, movements. Um, and then finally, uh, Douglas North. So Douglas North, um, if you think about new institutional economics, he's one of the guys who uh, created that. So N North essentially looked at, um, especially the neoclassical economists like Robert Solo and said, all right, so you have these fancy models. It's all about capital, labor, technology, um, but you have not been able to explain for decades why so few countries are rich and why so many countries fail. So basically, <laughs> the models, all this quantification, you, this, is just, this is just inadequate. Um, and he said what's missing were institutions history, culture, legal institutions, informal institutions, the things that actually cause systems and societies to run well. So he I started working with political scientists and historians and others and um, created new institutional economics, which is now a very influential strand of literature in development economics, which helps to explain why so few countries are rich. So as you can see, lots of disagreements among economists, um, and that's how it really should be. Um, so I've already gone through um, some of these, uh, the, um, uh, the great economists. So I'm just going to um, selectively pick out a few highlights and then move on to talking about um, how these ideas tie the ideas that I'm going to review briefly to, um, to the issues um, of today. So Adam Smith, as I mentioned, um, The Wealth of Nations, he published this in 1776 because he intentionally timed it to influence the American War of Independence. He thought that Britain should resign itself to the mediocrity of its position and stop wasting money on ruinous wars and instead accept that the colonists may no longer be colonists, but we would freely trade with them. So like the other great economists that I write about, not only were they part of the big debates, um, they actively shaped the way this um, society evolved. And um, like others, Adam Smith um, was a philosopher. Um, he was actually the commissioner of customs for Scotland. Um, they were much broader than being uh, technical uh, you know, economists. They did the technical stuff and then they applied it to the big issues. And that started from the father of economics. Oh, and by the way, like a lot of economists um, and the great, uh, kind of the, you know, the greats, um, Adam Smith was really hard on himself. In fact, he thought he didn't achieve enough in his lifetime. And he was so disappointed with his output that he wanted all of his manuscripts to be burned after his death because it wasn't good enough. So, <laughs> oh, and he spent 10 years writing The Wealth of Nations. This is going to be a recurring theme. They never think they're good enough, productive enough and then they have this massive impact. Um, so the next time you're procrastinating, just remember, 10 years, Wealth of Nations. <laughs> okay, so I've talked about David Ricardo. Um, and, um, and just uh, 
Uh, when I said he is a disciple of Adam Smith, I meant that generally, because you can see from the dates, um, he actually, uh, he never met Adam Smith. So Ricardo um, actually um, was never, uh, had no degree. He never studied economics. He was a stockbroker who bet the right way on the Battle of Waterloo. And then he became very wealthy. And then I guess what happens when you become very wealthy is that you grow bored. I guess, I wouldn't know. <laughs> so he was on holiday in Bath, and he happened to pick up a copy of The Wealth of Nations. He taught himself economics, and then he wrote the theory of comparative advantage. And then he also wrote, wrote the theory of rent-seeking, and he also wrote the theory of Ricardian equivalence. So of course, um, do not take that as a reflection of whether you should be doing your economics degree. <laughs> it's just that um, this uh, incredibly, uh, you know, he uh, absolutely changed the face of economics. Um, oh, and then like Adam Smith, he was a businessman, investor, um, economist, author, and then he entered parliament later on by buying a seat and he became an MP. So, um, and then Karl Marx, um, so Marx, I've already mentioned, father of, of uh, communism. Um, so Marx, his theory is that capitalism results in crisis um, and then revolution. So during the Panic of 1873, he and Frederick Engels, his co-author, who must be the, the least recognized co-author like ever, <laughs> but the Communist Manifesto was actually written by both of them. Engels got so excited that the revolution was coming, he started to uh, practice shooting on horseback, readying for the war. Um, and then um, no revolution came, the long depression came and went. <laughs> and um, so like all good economists, Marx changed his theory. He then decided it wasn't going to be a crisis that led to revolution. The crisis was going to be income inequality. That would lead to revolution. So he's now looking at the Gilded Age um, in the United States, which is the latter part of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And this is obviously a period of high levels of income inequality. And that's relevant today because we are now, again, in the second Gilded Age in terms of um, the United States having a higher level of income inequality than even during the first Gilded Age. And will it lead to revolution? It certainly, I think, led to revival of ideas around socialism, if not communism. So, oh, and by the way, um, Karl Marx was a disappointment to his family throughout his life, um, his wife, uh, signed her stationery, Baroness von Westphalen, because she comes from a Prussian aristocratic family. Um, and they were all very embarrassed to have a revolutionary as, um, you know, as a member of their family. Her sister was married to Lion Phillips of the Phillips Electronics uh, uh, conglomerate. Um, so um, but anyways, Marx is well remembered today. <laughs> um, and then I mentioned Alfred Marshall. But let me say a word about Irving Fisher and then I'll move on to um, a few of the issues. So um, Irving Fisher shifted the headquarters of economics um, to the United States. Um, he started the American neoclassical uh, tradition. American neoclassical economics is obviously hugely um, dominant. Um, but the reason um, you wouldn't have heard of him before necessarily, or he doesn't get included in books like this, even though he wrote the theory of debt deflation. That's the theory that Fed Chairman, former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke developed in his financial accelerator model to explain how, what happens after a um, banking crash. And because of his theory, we didn't repeat the worst mistakes of the 1930s. Um, so he is hugely influential. He also did the quantity theory of money rigorously. So that underpins monetarism, and you'll have seen the Fisher equation. And yet, even though he moved economics to America, you, he doesn't get included in books like this because in 1929, he predicted the stock market was on a permanently high plateau. So then after the great crash of 1929, the stock market, uh, he then spent the 1930s predicting a quick turnaround of the U.S. economy. And then when the U.S. economy fell into a second recession in 1937, um, he lost his reputation and he lost his fortune um, because the problem Fisher had was he was a Yale economist. Um, his problem was that he married rich. <laughs> 
Apparently it's a problem. Um, so his wife's money was why they lived so comfortably in their house in New Haven. And so he never felt comfortable with that. So he wanted to make his own money. So like the other great economists, he was also a business person. He was an inventor. So do you know what a Rolodex is? Oh, thank you. Somebody nodded. So <laughs> before the iPhone, before the contacts, a Rolodex is when you have an index card. He cut a couple of notches on the bottom and stuck the index card on a roller. So this is the early 20th century when data was becoming more important. And so this way you could easily access contacts and data. So this is a great invention of the time. He made a fortune selling the patent, setting up a company. Um, but to make real money, you have to bet on the stock market. So he borrowed a margin, bet on the stock market, lost everything after the Roaring Twenties. And to make it even worse, he was indebted to his sister-in-law for the rest of his life. Um, and then uh, he couldn't afford to live in his big house in New Haven, so Yale bought the house and let him live in it if he could pay the rent. And then he couldn't afford the rent, so then he had to move out of the house and move into a small flat. Um, and then he's in a small flat, and then his wife dies, and then he died. But it's okay, because his ideas live on. <laughs> um, and so that's Irving Fisher. So that kind of gives you a sense of what's happened in terms of the major um, economic changes. You'll be familiar with Keynes. Uh, Schumpeter, I've discussed um, their engagement. So Schumpeter, for instance, you'll have heard of him because of creative destruction. So this idea that um, the other economists have it all wrong. So this is a recurring theme. <laughs> the others have it all wrong. You have to study firms, their innovation, and when they go bust, that's what drives economic cycles. But his most influential work is actually Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, published to influence the debates of the day. Um, and the Hayek I've talked about, Robinson I've talked about, um, Friedman, the Libertarian, North, Solo. So before I do um, the, uh, the kind of the issues, um, the rivalries. So I have said, I think, uh, repeatedly that economics is a battle of ideas. Um, I actually meant that literally. <laughs> um, this is a rap battle. So how many of you have seen Hamilton um, or like to see Hamilton? You must see Hamilton. It's as good as advertised. Absolutely amazing. So if you haven't seen it, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, there's a rap battle. <laughs> Um, where uh, Alexander Hamilton argues against Thomas Jefferson over, um, you know, issues of the day, right? So um, Friedrich Hayek versus John Maynard Keynes, they adamantly disagreed over the causes of the Great Depression. So two rappers play Keynes and um, Hayek, and they rap out um, Fear the Boom and Bust. This YouTube video has over six and a half million views, and it's just like Hamilton. They literally um, battle um, it out. But um, it was so popular, they did a sequel um, over the causes of the Great Depression, what Keynes and what Hayek would say about what happened in 2009. So they're great videos. Um, but Keynes always had an advantage over Hayek um, because Keynes was known for his pithy phrases. So, you know, Keynes, uh, you know, Keynes said, um, uh, in a, uh, a speculator um, is one who runs risks of which he is aware. An investor is one who runs risks of which he is unaware. Um, so Keynes had a way with words. He was, you know, very, uh, very pithy. Friedrich Hayek was an Austrian economist at the Austrian School of Economics. Hayek was brought to the LSC um, to actually pit the LSC against the dominant Cambridge school at the time. But Friedrich Hayek's English was so poor, his students at the LSC asked him to lecture in German because it'd be more understandable. Um, so communication, I've always felt, was a big part of, uh, of economic success. So um, these rivalries, this is one example, but there are many others. And as I say, that to me is one of the most important lessons from economics. There is a social science. There's never any absolutely right answers. There are arguments, there's evidence. And one of the things that great economists always stressed is you should argue the ideas fiercely, but it should never be personal. You should never resort to ad hominem attacks. No matter how fierce the rivalry between Hayek and Keynes, between LSE and Cambridge, um, during um, the Second World War, 
Keynes invited the LSE and housed Hayek at King's College, Cambridge, because the LSE was obviously in London and, you know, being bombed. And um, they even spent a very well-documented evening on the roof of King's College Chapel looking out for uh, German bombers on the horizon. Um, so, you know, disagree over the ideas, and you should, and help others understand where you're coming from, but it's never, ever um, ad hominem. So I'm now going to take an informal poll. Um, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands. I won't have time to go through all these issues. I'm just going to pick a couple that you're interested in. We'll just spend a few minutes on that before going to Q&A. So, um, so just show your hand. Just raise your hand if you're interested in this question. Um, should the government rebalance the economy? Okay. Um, People are always so polite. They always raise their hands on the first question, regardless if they're maybe they're really interested. But I appreciate it. Um, do trade deficits matter? Okay. Um, can China become rich? Okay, quite a few into that. Is inequality inevitable? Okay, lots of hands on that. Um, are we at risk of repeating the 1930s? Ah, uh, poor Fisher. <laughs> um, to invest or not invest? Okay, quite a few hands on that. Uh, what drives, oh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges. <laughs> there's a second page. Um, what drives innovation? Okay. What can we learn from financial crises? Okay. Uh, why are wages so low? Okay. Uh, are central banks doing too much? A few hands there. Why are so few countries prosperous? Oh, lots of hands there. Okay. Do we face a slow growth future? Okay. And is globalization in trouble? Oh, actually, quite a few hands there. Okay, so I think from that, if I did, is globalization in trouble and um, inequality? That seemed to be a report from the first one. Okay, so is inequality inevitable? So um, this is a chart of the Gini coefficient. So the Gini coefficient is a measure of absolute income inequality. So a Gini coefficient of one means one person has all of the income. Zero means that everyone has an equal amount of income. So the Gini coefficient for the United States and Canada are plotted here. So um, as you can see, there is a structural gap between the Gini coefficients, the levels of income inequality between two countries, which are actually rather similar institutionally and apologies to any Canadians in here, but sometimes it's actually really hard to tell if you're Canadian or American. Um, and people kind of default to saying you're American, so sorry. <laughs> um, the reason I chose it is because um, distance-wise and culturally, they're very similar, but Canadian levels of income inequality are very similar to that of Europe. So what that suggests, and it's a structural gap, is that when you have differential returns to factors, which you inevitably do in capitalist societies, um, then it does result in income inequality, um, but it's a political choice as to how much redistribution is done in order to reduce that level of inequality. So the different ways to reduce inequality, um, most of the principles are pretty obvious. You want to do it in a way that doesn't disincentivize work. Moderate redistribution has no impact um, on economic growth, but if you have persistently different levels of income inequality, and in the United States, it's now so high, it's higher than the Roaring Twenties, the Gilded Age before that, then what mechanisms do you use to reducing an inequality that's consistent with the political uh, will? And that's actually very difficult. So one structural difference between Canada and the United States is that um, the United States has a very small state. So in terms of the federal government as a share of GDP, um, it's probably quite similar to that of East Asian countries, which actually have very small states. So we're talking not the OECD average of about 50% of GDP, which is what government is. In the United States, it's about half that. So redistribution actually does require choosing the size of the state. And then there's other mechanisms you can use. So in other words, you don't have to only do it through redistribution. You could think about pre-distribution, which is what East Asian countries did. So they reallocated land, for instance. Uh, I think uh, that's quite difficult to do, but you could do it when you're starting a nation, <laughs> um, which is what some of them did, where they invest in human capital so that that's redistributed more equally. So in other words, Korea focused on primary and secondary education, giving people 
the equality of opportunities to reduce income inequality. So the choices are pre-distribution, redistribution, equality of outcomes, or equality of opportunities. So countries with a bigger welfare state tend to opt for the latter, this hand. So that's equality of outcomes, more redistribution. America has always been more about pre-distribution and equality of opportunities. But we are now at a point where income inequality is so high, I think it is time to revisit where you sit on this calculus. But it's a political decision, decision I would want to stress. Um, and then the other question about is globalization in trouble? Share some of the commonalities, um, because it is also about pre-distribution and redistribution. So we know that um, trade creates losers, um, winners and losers. Every, somebody always loses from trade. So even though the main losers from, uh, if you wanted to find them as people who've suffered real wage losses or stagnation over the last few decades are mid-skilled workers, even if most of that is due to technology, globalization did play a role. But what do you, how do you help the losers is the debate. It's exactly the same calculus. Is it to give them money after the fact or help them retrain? Is it pre-distribution or is it redistribution? And this issue is fairly well known, as in we know that trade creates losers and redistributive policies haven't really helped them, and that creates a political backlash. So the debate now is can we think about ways to pre-distributively help those who will be displaced by a country no longer specializing in the sector in which those workers live. So one of the um, proposals that um, has been put forward is that governments could undertake big public infrastructure projects. So take manufacturing workers who are laid off in factories, put them to work in construction in essentially another mid-skilled blue collar type job and give them work and then help them retrain. So that's one of the ideas that's um, being bandied about because what's currently working is creating a, isn't working and is creating a political backlash against globalization. The big challenge in economics is whether you can retrain workers. Um, it's very hard to move a worker from a manual job into a professional job. But um, I was speaking on a panel of economists um, at a uh, public at a uh, festival, so there were a lot of um, members of the public there, and um, and uh, the economists were saying it's hard to retrain people, and um, and then a couple of guys in the audience raised their hands and said they're in their fifties and they're learning to code, so maybe in the digital age it's more possible. But that's the debate that we we are having. And, uh, sorry, the slide's moved. Um, and so the, the way you ought to think about doing it is through an ethical lens. And this is where Paul Samuelson, the last of the great general economists, he passed away in 2009. This was one of his contributions. So you might know Paul Samuelson as the um, author of Factor Price Equalization, which of course is how you get the wage implications from factor distributions due to trade. Um, but like all the great economists, he did lots of things. So one of his um, other um, areas of work is he worked on this idea of an ethical lens. So it's an adaptation of John Rawls's Veil of Ignorance in his book, A Theory of Justice, The Political Philosopher. So the Rawlsian Veil of Ignorance says, if you stand behind a veil of ignorance and you're gonna vote on a policy, not knowing if you're that laid off blue collar worker who needs a job or you're the taxpayer who pays for that um, program, um, how would you vote? So you, you make this an ethical lens, a veil of ignorance. It's a way of deciding by removing personal interests from the equation. It also explains why it's so difficult to pass good policies, because that's a very difficult stance to take. Um, so Paul Samuelson's work really helps us understand the distributional impact of globalization. He was once asked, and this globalization issue has been going on for decades, um, if the issues are so well known, why don't policymakers fix it? Why don't they do something about it? So Samuelson was an advisor to a number of US presidents, and his answer was, I can't think of a president who has been overburdened by knowledge of economics. Um, no contemporary references here. <laughs> so, um, and then finally, I'm just going to conclude with a couple of quotes. So, um, this is advice from Robert Solow. Um, if you want to solve our economic problems, he advises, never claim more than you can justify. Always include the qualifications. Um, 
that's by not appearing to know all the answers, um, that's how you gain respect and speaking to the general public. Um, and then finally, my favorite quote is from Joan Robinson, the best reason to know economics. Um, the purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. Thank you very much. So we've got about 10 minutes before lunch um, to, uh, for your questions, so feel free to uh, if you raise your hand, uh, tell me who you are, uh, what program you're in, uh, that would be, um, that'd be super. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm James, I study European economics. Okay. First um, would you say that there's a weakness in economics today that we always focus on the orthodox theories? Mm -hmm. You spoke about the great economists, they had such a broad uh, scope to come from being humanities students first. Mm -hmm. Is that something that maybe we're missing today? Yeah, I absolutely think um, that is. So um, the great economists cross disciplines. So when they realized you couldn't find the answer for the specific question they were looking at, um, they worked with people from other disciplines. And many of them were actually trained in other disciplines. So I think there's never, when you tackle a big question, only going to be one disciplinary lens that can help explain it. The question is, can you deploy the economic tools to help contribute to that debate without seeming like you've got the answer because you've come from an economic standpoint. Um, but have no doubt, it's very difficult, even though I've highlighted the disagreements, it's very difficult to go against the mainstream. So Douglas North, I mentioned the father of new institutional economics. He, um, well, North's story is that um, he started off as a mainstream economist, as you all do. He did his PhD on regional economic growth in the United States using neoclassical growth models written by Robert Solo in the 1950s. And then he began to realize you couldn't explain differential economic performance by just looking at neoclassical growth models. So he started working with political scientists in the 1980s to come up with this theory of institutional economics. Um, but North, throughout his career was never at a top economics department at a top university. It wasn't until he won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1993, then he got all the visiting professorships. <laughs> um, but I think that's why it is, it is difficult. But I think um, as we re-examine economics today, I think it's absolutely um, something we should all be um, you know, looking at, the limitations of economics, um, but train yourself in the tools so that you can contribute um, appropriately and never think that other disciplines don't have something to offer. Uh, my own background is that I'm a, uh, I've got a law and economics background. So I've always been, I think, very open to the idea that um, different disciplines look at issues very differently and we ought to be looking at them. So, great. Any other um, questions? Yeah, sorry, that filming light tends to, yeah. Oh, I just walked back from it. No, yeah. that's okay. <laughs> Why do you think Americans are so scared of uh, socialist, capitalist um, economics? Oh, um, I think it's a function of the Cold War. Um, I think for a generation of people, it's very ingrained. Because remember, the Soviet Union at the time was the evil empire. Um, and for those of you who remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's okay, I'm not looking. I'm not looking. <laughs> um, it was the defining moment for a generation. So when you talk about socialism, even new socialism, it's evocative of not the economic system necessarily, solely that, it's the political system that came with it, the, you know, the loss of freedom, all of that. So when I described earlier that, especially in the 1980s, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, the big debates were about economics were about economists who are equating democracy with capitalism, that I think frames why Americans um, have a very strong view about, um, about socialism and communism. And it actually partly explains the, the tension between uni uh, the United States and China. Of course, that's not the only source of the tension. The, the real tension is because China is going to overtake the US in aggregate size in the next couple of decades. But part of it is that China is not um, a democratic capitalist system. Um, and I think that all plays into it. Although um, there's a great quote um, from Paul Samuelson um, that I 
wrote in, I write about in the epilogue, he said that um, the difference between capitalism and communism is that under capitalism, man exploits man. Under communism, it's the exact opposite. <laughs> that might explain US and China. <laughs> um, great, I think we might have quite time for just one more question and, and then we'll let, uh, yep. Um, so how, how do Western nations with increasingly protectionist views mm. uh, affect its competitiveness in the global marketplace? Yeah, another great question. Um, so I think the, we need to revisit um, comparative advantage and trade. So one of the, the kind of the lessons we should remind ourselves of, and of course, comparative advantage has gone through many iterations um, since Ricardo's model, including by new trade theory. So people like Paul, Saint, uh, Paul Krugman, um, is your competitiveness depends on the efficiency of your own productive resources. So in other words, a country's trade position is a reflection of their domestic strengths and weaknesses. So if a country is highly productive and highly efficient, as the United States is, um, then the trade position doesn't, it reflects a myriad of things um, but unless you can't afford your trade deficit, it's not an issue. So in other words, the U.S. does run a massive trade deficit that makes you think the U.S. must have some type of um, structural weakness. And maybe it has some around, um, you know, around manufacturing. Maybe it has some issues around services exports, given that services is not as open um, to global trade as the rest of the world. But as you know, the current account position reflects lots of things, including investment flows, portfolio flows, all, the, all that kind of stuff. So there are, some, there are some impediments to trade that's captured in it, but to change the overall picture requires looking at strengthening where um, a country's competitiveness is weaker. So I'll give you an example. The United States, um, as I say, the trade deficit has been there for decades. So the United States is actually a really productive, highly technological um, economy. And that's reflected by the reshoring of manufacturing. So advanced manufacturing, which are sectors, and I write about this in the book, um, that devote a lot to R&D. The United States, um, this is under President Obama, has already seen companies move back to the US because wages are rising in China, the shell revolution has reduced energy costs, and American workers are technologically productive, and you need fewer of them because of automation. So the CEO, Stanley, Stanley Black & Decker, um, told me that it costs the same, the same to produce a power tool in the United States as it does in China. Um, once you take into account all of those factors, higher productivity of US workers, the lower cost of production, the transport costs, higher wages in China, and he gets an added boost because um, he gets to put on the box made in the USA. So there's a brand element to that. So to me, that's the lesson from comparative advantage, which is, yes, of course, you should look at your trade position, but what determines it is actually um, your competitiveness within the economy, your efficiency, your productivity, your technological uh, position, and then you try to remove the structural impediments to trade. For instance, services is not open around the world to trading. Free trade is not free, so there are tariffs, differential tariffs on manufactured goods. You need to work on that, but focus on your own domestic economy. And then, of course, recognize that the external position of your country is only a problem if you can't afford the debt. And if you happen to be the world's biggest economy and you issue the reserve currency and you invest lucratively overseas, never forget about the financial and the capital accounts. That's actually one of the biggest, that's another symbol of America's strength which is its strong financial system, which is why the dollar has this position. So to me, the lesson for all countries, including this one, is if you want to prove your trade position, it's about improving domestic productivity, technology, um, and making yourself um, a much more efficient uh, producer, and then trade will sort itself out. If you're a developing country, um, you've got a big trade deficit, I would say, yeah, okay, then there might be a problem. Um, and that's why they have a lot of reserves. But for most advanced economies, trade is a byproduct of what you do at home. And that's, that's what really should matter. So good. Uh, okay, we'll squeeze in one more quickly, and then we'll okay, can't, can't delay lunch. <laughs> So mm. higher wages may not necessarily, or you know, interest rates 
falling or rising might not necessarily motivate yeah. people to react the way they did. Like for example, with Brexit, like all a lot of a lot of analysis shows that people will be poorer off from it. But polls show that people, um, majority of people who voted for Brexit still want to continue mm. with it. And that's maybe what's motivating them to make that choice is not necessarily economics, money, it's more maybe yeah. or identity or yeah, so um, the, uh, the final chapter I write about Brexit and I write about um, Trumpism as well. And I think I touch on these themes because um, if you, you know, we talked about globalization, this idea that people get left behind. In economics, the simple solution is you just do some redistribution and you make the losers you compensate the losers and the whole economy is better off and it's fine. But that's actually not how um, it, it works in reality. Um, people obviously don't just want a handout, they want prospects for their lives. And so this is why that debate, I think, is really important and why people reject the status quo because it's not just, because it's not just about economics, it's about a lot of things as well. And you start off your question by saying um, that economists view uh, people as robots. I thought it was quite funny because we're going to be replaced by robots. That's probably the biggest <laughs> trend. Um, but I think the, um, you know, one of the, uh, and so again, because this book is macro, it's not micro. I don't really deal with um, the micro theories around um, rational expectations, but I do deal with Keynesian economics. And one of the things about Keynesian economics is that it rejected um, that people just behaved um, efficiently. So savings doesn't equal investment, animal spirits guides investment, consumption behavior is affected by a lot of things. So. I think it's, um, there's one strand of economics um, that is now increasing under challenge around rational expectations. But throughout economics, the philosophers, the great economists, none of them viewed people as just a, a, you know, homo economicus. They always viewed them as having imperfect motivations, understanding. Um, and in fact, going all the way to Joseph Schumpeter, who said, if you really want to understand economics, um, you want, if you really want to know why Nokia was the biggest smartphone maker in the world a decade ago and is nowhere now, the answer to that is not looking at macroeconomic trends. You need to look at the companies, the entrepreneurs, see what motivates them, what's going on with them. Are they innovating? Are they not innovating? Are they being propped up? Are they zombie firms and all of that? That's actually where you get your real economic insights into what drives economic growth in cycles. And Schumpeter wrote a century ago. So this is a lesson that's always been there, but maybe has been a bit overlooked. Um, so I'll just finish with a little anecdote about Schumpeter and then um, we can chat over the, uh, the book signing um, as well. Is that, because um, I'll be over there for a few minutes. Um, so Schumpeter, um, he was another great economist who wasn't just an academic. He actually was an academic and then became the finance minister of Austria. Uh, he was such a disastrous finance minister, they asked him to leave after a year. And then he felt they, he, then he thought they, that um, they owed him. So they gave him a banking license. <laughs> so then he became a banker. <laughs> and then as a banker, um, he um, invested in all these companies. He was, he was writing about the Mitchell stands of the time, the middle, you know, the incredible growth of industry at the early part of the 20th century. Um, and even though he wrote about creative destruction, he could not get himself, when the market fell, to sell the failing companies because he got to know the entrepreneurs. So he hung on to those stocks. And then he was massively in debt. He was in debt for a decade. Um, and it took him a decade to pay off his debt. He moved to Harvard to get a higher salary as a professor there. And he was repaying his debts in Vienna for a decade after that because even the father of creative destruction couldn't get himself to actually do what his theory said, which is to let um, these firms go. Oh, the other thing about Schumpeter was that um, he fell in love with the daughter of the janitor of his building in Vienna when she was in her teens. And then uh, when she became an adult, um, they got married. His, her parents were furious. His mother was furious. Um, and then uh, they got married and then, uh, oh, and then the first year she died in childbirth. And then uh, Schumpeter moved to Harvard and was depressed his whole life. But he had great contributions. <laughs> you know, he was apparently, you know, really lively in all of his teaching. And, uh, you know, um, and uh, yeah, I should probably just end there. Thank you. <laughs>